Hi everyone, I'm Sophie. I work for Star Academies, a multi-academy trust with schools across the country. I'm not a teacher, but I'm privileged to work with teachers and school leaders as part of my job. I am a mum, and as the weeks go on, the novelty of this situation is wearing off, and I'm increasingly grateful that there are places to turn for ideas and support. To accompany our home learning advice line, Starline, we're hosting a weekly broadcast with a range of guests to cover different ideas to help keep your kids happy and learning. This week, we're joined again by Lisa Fathers, Director of Teaching School for Alliance for Learning and a part of uh, Bright Futures Educational Trust. Lisa joined us for the episode last week and when we were talking about what we might share, there were a couple of ideas um, and all of them sounded too good to miss. So after the success of last uh, week's episode, we thought we'd invite Lisa back to talk about this week's topic which is bereavement. Lisa delivers training in mental health first aid and is a co-chair for the Greater Manchester Mental Health in Education Board. While the return to school is on lots of people's minds, there will be children and families who have lost someone they love to COVID-19. This loss can be all-consuming and at a time like this, some of our normal coping mechanisms might not be possible. Lisa's joining us again today to share some ideas and to to help us and our children deal with bereavement. Thanks for joining us again, Lisa. No problem. Hi. Hi. So how do people typically respond to bereavement? Okay, so first of all, just to say there isn't one way to respond to bereavement. Obviously, we're all different. We all to respond. We all respond to, you know, awful life events in completely different ways. But there does seem to be some similarities in that people will generally experience kind of shock, anger, denial, um, perhaps a sense of yearning, um, then tied in with a bit of depression. Um, and after going through these kind of quite um, vivid emotions, will eventually, after a, a long um, base, of, base of time, come to kind of some kind of um, understanding, acceptance, um, and eventually some kind of resolution and peace with what's happened. But in terms of children uh, and young people, obviously the way that they deal with grief um, is slightly different because they're experiencing uh, grief and bereavement through their very small world. So if you imagine a a child's uh, biggest things in their lives are probably school and their friends, maybe their sports teams, and suddenly something awful has happened, something's come along um, that's been completely out of the blue uh, in some cases and it's probably the worst thing that could ever happen and depending on you know who that that person is in the child's life will um you know determine the the greater impact it has obviously if it, if a child has lost a parent um then that's probably one of the the worst things that can ever happen to a child um but it doesn't mean that that the child and or the young person won't recover from that and go on to to have a, a happy and fulfilled life um, equally, the, the child or young person might have lost a grandparent and it might be that the first time that they've lost somebody is, is now um, because they might have never lost a pet or, a, you know, uh, somebody else, a family friend, etc. So so it's still quite big um, and quite a big event. And I think what, what, what tends to happen with children and young people is that they realise um, that life isn't forever and that people die and that can be quite frightening especially for younger children and um, so we might see children becoming more clingy um particularly at bedtime we might see uh, children you know questioning mortality and their own mortality um but it will depend on the age of the child so for example uh, under fives um they might be able to say quite articulately that mummy died or, or grandma died of, of COVID-19. But then in the next sentence, they might say, uh, but is she picking me up from nursery? Um, so it, it's it's kind of magical thinking. It, it, they don't understand. Um, equally, magical thinking is a term we use um, to sometimes describe the very creative way that our younger children will think. And sometimes they will come up with their own rationale and reasons. Um, so it might well be that, um, you know, they think that they're to blame for the death um, that has happened. Um, there's a, a young person I know who heard that granny had died from a stroke and they misheard that, misinterpreted it, misinterpreted it and thought that that meant that every time you stroked somebody, they were going to die. 
Um, so I think it's really important that we use language in a really clear way with our children and young people um, to make sure that they, they do understand. And when we think about older children uh, and teenagers, they do understand that death has a finality about it and that they can be a bit more curious. Um, you know, they start to wonder about what happens after death and things like that. So it's really important in, within a family um, to be quite explicit about what your belief systems are, um, you know, whether you believe in heaven, et cetera, et cetera. That's really helpful. And I know that um, what a lot of children tend to um, feel is that that sadness that they feel might go on forever. Is there anything, um, have you got any ideas for how we can help them with that? Yeah, of course. So first of all, I think that it's really important to just remember that grief is up and down. Um, it's not linear. It doesn't happen in a really clear way. And um, a, a bereavement theorist called Banana in 2009 talked about oscillation. And a very simple way to think about that is puddles of grief. So if you imagine that children are jumping along and sometimes they're landing in a puddle of grief and it's really quite deep and it takes a while to get out. And then other times they'll land in another puddle of grief that actually is quite shallow and they'll remember that they're in the middle of getting their pee kit ready or that they're going to watch something or they're going to phone a friend so they'll jump out of that puddle quite quickly. Um, and they will oscillate between kind of normal routines and grief. And I think it's very important that we make sure our children and young people know that it's all right to laugh, it's all right to have fun, and that grandma or granddad or mom or dad or whoever it is will want them to laugh and to be happy again and that that they shouldn't feel guilty about that. Um, and we, you know, as adults, when we're experiencing grief, yes, we want to be left alone. We might want some time and we might take special leave of absence. We might, you know, need a bit of downtime to process. But equally, we, we want to be distracted, don't we? We want to, to take our way, ourselves away from what's going on. And, and that's the same for our children and young people. So getting them involved in doing some jobs or um, even thinking about, you know, planning, um, you know, the, the celebration of life or the funeral or whatever, or just watching a really good movie on Netflix and 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 that it's okay not to think about the worst thing that's that's happened uh, all the time i think the other really important thing is to just remember that for children and for for teenagers sometimes it's really hard to unpick what emotion they're feeling so for a very small child anger and sadness feel the same it just feels really bad mm. um and they don't know if it's anger or sadness so trying to get them to name the emotion um is is quite useful uh, and one way to do that is to perhaps use stones um, or rocks, quite good for children that don't like making eye contact and that like to fiddle. So they might have a, a really um, spiky stone, a really rough stone to talk about their feelings and emotions that are not great. Um, or they might have a, a nice stone, um, a sparkly one perhaps, to think about you know, the, the things that they like to do that make them feel happy mm -hmm. um, and, and they're allowed to do that without those feelings of guilt. And, and these stones can be dual use, actually. You can use them to, to um, as a bit of a memory tool as well. So you might talk about somebody that you've lost and use a sparkly stone to think about all the really nice things about that person. Yeah. But equally, we recognize that people are not perfect. So using a quite a rough, spi spiky stone to think about the things that weren't so great about somebody as well um, and being comfortable with, with those thoughts. And then you might use a, a smooth, everyday stone to think about the mundane things that, that you might have done with somebody, um, you know, whether that's walking to school or having a lunch, having your lunch or, or those kinds of things. So quite a nice way of thinking about memories and emotions as well. That, that's really helpful and we've all got access to a couple of stones <laughs> certainly my uh, coat is coat pocket is full of them from our walks with my five-year-old um and um what was uh, what was your thinking about how we might support with that feeling of the sadness never never ending yeah so quite a nice um a thing to think about is the fact that grief is awful it's it is awful it's all consuming and if, if we liken grief to a, a kind of red bo bowling ball um the size of the ball isn't going to go away it's going to stay like that and it hurts uh, and we used to think in terms of grief that over time that ball got smaller and smaller but actually what we found more helpful to think about is the ball doesn't get any um any smaller it stays the same size but if that ball is in a container for example a big jug what happens is that over time, the, the jug gets bigger. 
So the other things around that ball um, become more helpful and there are other nice things in the jug. So at first, the, re the red bowling ball fills the jug and if it moves, it touches the sides of the jug in a way that we can't get away from that pain. But over time, the jug in itself gets bigger. There's more space in there for other nice things so that we don't feel that grief all the time. And we only feel that, that bowling ball when it bumps against something. Um, and we, we take great care to fill the jug with other things so that it doesn't feel as big and as hard. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. And so what's different about bereavement during the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, so I said uh, at the beginning that I think I said that we're all experiencing a bit of community trauma at the moment. Um, you know, this 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 whole pandemic is quite traumatic on every level and we're all feeling a sense of loss. Uh, and one of the things that, that we've lost is the kind of routines. Now, in, if we think about grief, um, we talk about grief rituals. And at the moment, some grief rituals are not available to us because we can't have huge funerals in the way that we normally would. Um, we can't go down the road and hug um, other people in our family or hug friends that we might turn to for support. Um, for some of our children and young people, they're not even able to go into school at the moment and speak to their favourite teacher or their form tutor or their pastoral leader uh, and get that extra support from school. So it is very different. And, and you're right, Sophie, we shouldn't shy away from that. But what we have to try and, and think about is that during a pandemic we're all trying to um kind of regulate um how we feel and this links to uh, some work by bruce perry um about um regulate relate and reason and if we think about those three things that's what we need to try and do for our children who are grieving we need to help them regulate their feelings in, in some of the ways that i've already talked about but we also need to help them relate and we do that by having really sensitive conversations with them in a connected way mm -hmm. and i think the message here is that the worst has happened you know somebody has died who who, who the child and young person loves so talking about it isn't going to make it any worse so talking and talking a lot and maybe saying things in a clumsy way it doesn't matter talking and getting children and young people to talk as well is really is really helpful okay that's really helpful thank you and, and what else can parents and carers do to help those that have been bereaved yeah so there's some quite i've got some quite good practical suggestions so at first i think the thing is we need to let our young people have a bit of time mm -hmm. and when the children and young people are ready um to maybe try and process some of those memories and those emotions then there are some quite nice things that we can do so for example you might think about um creating a memory box mm -hmm. um you know you might get a really nice special box or you might decorate a box and you might fill it with things that remind you of the person that has died so um it might be you know if you think about using the senses there might be a, a you know a fluffy scarf or photograph or anything at all that, that reminds them of that person um and that's something that can be put away and got out um, and, and not something that needs to be, um, you know, hidden. And, and all, all members of the family could perhaps contribute to that memory box. Mm -hmm. it, it would depend on the family dynamics. I think the other thing to think about, um, there are some really nice things. Uh, number one, body mapping. I don't know if you've heard of that. Um, so you might draw a body out and you might get children and young people to draw um what they're feeling and where on the body. So, for example, if a child is feeling quite anxious following the, the, the death of a, a loved one, they might draw, um, I don't know, a boat or something like that in the tummy. And that might enable you to have a conversation with them about, oh, how does your tummy feel at the moment? You know, let's just unpick that. Um, the other thing is a blob tree. Um, so this is a kind of bodies on a tree uh, and there are bodies hanging all over the tree and in different places. And you might say, you know, where would you put yourself today and where do you want to be next week? And they might say, well, at the moment, I feel like I'm on a limb hanging off the tree. Um, but by next week, I want to be climbing back to the top. Um, and you might also say, well, where were you before this awful bereavement happened? Mm. Um, so that you can help them think about how they climb back to where they want to be. Mm -hmm. What I would say is it's really important to check um, because I had a, a child um, recently who told me that they were dangling off one of the branches and I was quite concerned about how that might mean that they were feeling and actually they were having a really good swing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's important, isn't it, that we remember we are dealing with children and young people. <laughs> 
Yeah, and it goes back to that frame of reference that you were talking about last week about the context of where they're at and what they've got around them to help them process and hanging off a tree sounds like fun for a child probably. (laughs) Exactly. Um, The other one that's quite nice, Sophie, is to use a button tree. So you might get a load of old buttons, um, uh, different ones, and you might draw a tree out and get, get the children to try and put a button for each member of their family, maybe some friends on there as well in different branches on the tree. And it's a nice way of of reminding children that there are other people in their family that love them, who are secure and are there for them. But it's also a a nice way of perhaps remembering people that used to be in the family that have died long before and that are also on the tree so that they understand that that, that kind of life goes on, but there are still these uh, protective um, people in their lives, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And are there any other resources we can share links to under the video that you think would be helpful? Yes, absolutely. So um, you'll see the links underneath um, directing you to Winston's Wish website. There are some specific um, bereavement blob trees and things like that on there. There are also some really nice emotion cards and and other specific child bereavement resources. Uh, Cruise is also um, a a really good website with lots of resources on there. I think the other thing to just um, remind parents to to think about is that... um, children in the family will do as well as the other adults around them so if you're really struggling it's really important that you get yourself some support as well and it's that old um kind of oxygen mask um analogy isn't it where we have to put our own oxygen mask on first on an airplane in order to support the children and young people that we're with and it's the same you know we have to put our own um support mechanisms in place for us to be able to help other people um but i think the other thing to just be mindful of is if you've got a child or a young person and kind of maybe six to nine months down the line they're still not wanting to see their friends or wanting to go to school if, if we're back in school um then that that might be a bit of a red flag that perhaps um their grief is a bit more complicated mm. um and that you might need to seek some more support from, from winston's wish or, or from the local support um lines in your area Okay, thanks so much, Lisa. And we'll include um, some links to some of those other services that you can access locally. Um, There are some great national helplines. Um, You can also call Starline and we're happy to help signpost you to the um, best service to support whatever situation you're in. Um, And Starline is also here um, to help with your home learning needs. We know that the situation is currently changing weekly for lots of families as lockdown starts to ease. With over a month until the end of term, it may be hard to keep up the motivation for learning at home, but Starline is here to help. For more personalised advice and guidance, we would encourage you to call Starline on the number at the bottom of the screen. That's 0330 313 9162. You can also send us a message on our website, starline.org.uk. Uh, or get in touch on Facebook. Just search Starline Helpline. We look forward to seeing you next week. In the meantime, stay safe.